learning. Dr. Matthews Research Fellowship at Johns Hopkins provided the basis for the initiative for this exhibit. During his time there, he was responsible for establishing the HOPE initiative, which sought to provide high-quality community gaming experiences children on dialysis. Dr. Ziba Matthews is an internist and worked as a hospital medical medicine specialist for nine years before taking on her current position as the medical director of palliative care program in Midland. Being on the front line of hospital medicine for all these years has given her first-hand experience in dealing with the menace of resistant bacteria. The importance of preserving the potency of current antibiotics and developing new ones in, is the driving force behind this exhibition. Coming from a family of educators, she loves to teach and figure out fun ways to educate medical students and the public about arduous medical concepts. Along with her husband, she develops games for their medical education company, Nerdcore Medical. So I'm delighted to have this exhibit and have both the doctors here. Uh, Dr. Matthews will kind of introduce you to the exhibit and the theory and the principle and the concept behind the exhibit experience. Dr. Matthews. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, I should probably couch this discussion by saying that um, uh, we had some technical difficulties on the outset. Um, uh, my immediate supervisor and role model, Gary Barnes, uh, sacrificed his bandwidth uh, by creating a, a hotspot sort of in real time, and we are tenuously existing on that hotspot. So at any point, this, this talk may evaporate in our very eyes, uh, but that's all right. It's all about the art. So, so uh, George uh, rightly said that um, uh, I am an internal medicine trained physician, and um, I did some additional training in something called clinical informatics, and that's essentially the marriage of medicine with technology. Um, but I am here tonight in the capacity of a supreme nerd. So, um, and uh, I, I think it's a fair statement to say that uh, my wife is also a nerd. Um, she's a cute nerd though, but still a nerd. And if you're here in Odessa, Texas on a Wednesday night sitting in on an exhibition that fuses microbiology with art, it's possible you might be a red, I mean, a nerd. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to kind of set some expectations on, uh, on the level of intelligence of this particular presentation. The good stuff, I should say, is, uh, is coming shortly. But uh, what I wanted to do was kind of give you a little bit of background on the craziness that is the healing blade and um, the large amounts of peyote that were, I mean, the... <laughs> Uh, the concept that, that we kind of fell in love with, which was conceptual blending. And so I wanted to walk you through some of it. I will start off by saying there, there are two videos in here that will probably not work because we, that door is closed. <laughs> so, so the phone is on the other side and uh, it's, it's technical, zeros and ones. So uh, anyhow, that's how I explain a lot of the uh, at the meetings when the physicians are throwing computers at me saying, why aren't these working? I, I shake my hands in the air and say zeros and ones. It doesn't work. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the origin story. Um, Sam Raimi, the director of the first Spider-Man film adaptation and probably the beginning of a, a renaissance in superhero movies, sort of in popular culture, I once said that every superhero needs an origin story. And um, in fact, uh, we believe that uh, antibiotics are types of superheroes. Well, superheroes that, you know, through time have kind of faded in, their, in, their, in, in our appreciation for them, but they need an origin story. And, and this is their origin story in our view. So essentially the concept for the Healing Blade came from rounds. So, Every day when physicians uh, take care of patients, they engage in this thing called rounds. And um, it actually comes from the, well, 
there's some debate about this, but uh, the dome at uh, Johns Hopkins where people would ca call sort of the, the results and the statuses of their patients w was round. And so when they did rounding, that's essentially where the term came from. And um, when we were on rounds, and this was in a small community hospital in Hobbs, New Mexico, or Hobbs, America, as the Hobbses like to refer to it, um, I was with a group of students, and we had this wonderful discussion about, you know, how do you pick the correct antibiotic for the correct infection? And um, I was kind of going in my head as to how to kind of create a nice metaphor for um, uh, determining the cognitive thought process that goes on in a physician's head. It turns out that even before I had been playing a video game called Mass Effect, um, and uh, in many ways, uh, this was the birthplace of the idea of the healing blade. So in that game, you play as uh, essentially a, um, a sort of a, a space marine that is kind of dealing with um, a threat to humanity in the universe. And it's a very strategic game. Interestingly enough, uh, Mass Effect was developed by a company called BioWare, which was originally founded by three physicians, of all things, um, which, you know, uh, is, is really here nor there. But it's a wonderful game, highly recommended for, and, and, and actually mandatory uh, homework evening assignment for you all. Uh, it only has about 400 hours of gameplay. Uh, so. Um, so we were playing uh, Mass Effect, and I realized a lot of the same tasks that I was doing in the game. So I was gathering reconnaissance information, and based on that information, kind of measuring probabilities on which weaponry I should use, and then sending it out into the field. Well, no duh, that, that was my sort of aha moment. We were doing something very similar in rounds in the ICU. We were making determinations about you know, an infiltrate or sort of something that looks abnormal on a chest x-ray, an elevation, elevation of a white count, the presence of a fever, um, and a person coughing purulent sputum, making a determination that, you know, the patient probably most likely has pneumonia. And then we were matching our reconnaissance information, which was, where did that patient come from? Did the patient come from uh, the community or a nursing home? And that information is, is key to making a, a decision as to which antibiotic to use. So we were using similar thought processes in terms of how to go about creating that, that right decision. And so it was that moment that we said, wow, what if we took, took that concept of rehearsing the correct choice for the correct antibiotic and reimagined it in a, in a world um, we were big into Lord of the Rings at the time, so we were talking about dragons and, and, and swords and sorcerers. And um, what if we kind of exploded that world and made everything metaphorical? And that was essentially the basis discussion for the concept of the healing blade. So, um, so listen to your attendings on rounds because wonderful things happen on rounds is the, is the moral of that story. Now this is where we get to the uh, the first video and really what I wanted to do is show you the video to give you an idea of what we're talking about so we have antibiotics and bacteria and uh, There's some debate as to who are the good guys who are the bad guys um, But for the most part the antibiotics because they're on our side and we we develop them They're the good guys So we refer to them as the apothecary healers and then on the on the, the darker side of things we have the uh, lords of pestilence and uh, those are the bacterial creatures. So um, with a bit of luck, some of this video may load and, and you'll get an idea as to um, what we were planning to do with it.
Ah. Uh, I was actually secretly hoping the buffering would stop. Oh. Yay, we got the whole video. <laughs> I never thought I would get a round of applause for a completed YouTube video. But uh, <laughs> hooray for Verizon, Gary. <laughs> hooray for paying your bills. Um, so welcome to SOMA. Uh, so SOMA comes from the, um, uh, the word root body. So all of these interactions, uh, these battles, if you will, between bacteria and antibiotics occur on this world. And in this world, we have uh, metaphoric allusions to actual human body parts. So we have an area called Respiro Forest, the caverns of Bladara, the marshes of Elementum. You don't want to go there. So um, that's essentially how we started world building and uh, developing this idea, which was originally, um, in, its, in its first form, a card game. And so uh, my research at Hopkins had to do with something called applied game theory. So everything from the points that we collect on our credit cards to um, Candy Crush is essentially a variant of John Nash's sort of uh, ethereal work uh, regarding game theory. But if you've ever been to a pure mathematics game theory lecture, uh, it has a lot less dragons and a lot more sort of numbers and letters that, uh, and, and equations. So um, stick, with, stick with the applied stuff. So we then ta started talking about building the game and trying to figure out how we could create a game engine that was based on reality. So does the correct antibiotic def defeat the correct bacteria? And this was where the fun stuff really started happening. So we divided this world, as I told you, into two sides, the apothecary healers and the lords of pestilence. This is an example of an apothecary healer, the antibiotic erythromycin. So she's a combatant. She has, um, uh, this is a simplified antibiogram of what she's effective against in terms of the bacteria. And we also built in a miniature backstory with regards to um, her, uh, you know, her origins, so to speak. And so, just to give you an idea of this concept of learning in metaphor, the, the crystalline structure of erythromycin under a mass spectrometer results in this beautiful reddish hue. And so, we would read about the antibiotic, um, determine how we wanted her as a character to look, and hence, she has this wonderful ornate armor that, um, that shines red. So we tried to plant as many Easter eggs as possible into the art so that students could then not only play the game and rehearse choosing the correct antibiotic for the correct, um, uh, for the correct infection, but also remember some of the more salient features about some of the, uh, uh, the antibiotics themselves. So the backstories is where we really started having a great deal of fun with these characters. So if, if you wouldn't mind me just reading this out, um, this was the first pestilence agent to cross over to the side of the apothecaries. She's recognized by her reddish armor and auras, often used with pe when penicillin warriors are contraindicated due to allergy. She has been known to break the hearts of men on the battlefield. So erythromycin used inappropriately or in a renal failure setting can in fact cause uh, something called QT prolongation, which is not a good thing. And uh, we worked hard with this wonderful group. Uh, I'm glad Zhu Wei's name is there. Um, so uh, the story of how we worked with these artists was really one of happenstance. And so um, one of the co-developers co of the concept was actually roommates with a gentleman named Xiaolong Dai. And he heard about the project, fell in love with it, and said that I have a group of close friends that are trying to get their name out in artist circles and we would love to work on this with you. So hence began this six month period of Skype chats and calls back and forth and examples of images um, 
discussions about how and why the armor should be red, what kind of red, how thick the broadsword for Septriac. So just, just geekiness and nerdiness to the, to the nth degree, really, some shocking stuff. And then we have the Lords of Pestilence. Um, these are representative of different types of bacteria. And this is an example of Bacillus anthracis um, or anthrax. Uh, uh, well, the causative agent of the condition, um, anthrax. So once again, a combatant, vulnerabilities to certain antibiotics, and once again, uh, a dreaded foe covered in a protein carapace, thrives in both aerobic and anaerobic environments. Um, infestation results in the blackening of the earth and the release of spores that remain dormant. So um, if you've ever seen cutaneous anthrax, it causes a kind of frightening central necrosis, which is a fancy talk for the skin starts to die and turn black. And so we really wanted to capture that in the imagery of the art. And um, the artist you know, wanted to configure the spores as little flaming butterflies. And so, you know, we decided not to fight it. It looks pretty cool, and so we ran with it. Bacillus, bacilli, so all of our bacilli tend to be um, uh, worm-like dragon creatures, um, sort of in, in, in keeping with the, the bacilli uh, form. So hence, um, uh, hence uh, the, the development of that particular art. So this was the, the, the second aha moment that we had. So we had a game and we released at the American, School, American Medical Student Association um, convention and um, it, we had a fairly good turnout and uh, people were excited about it. And then just by pure happenstance we discovered that um, a group of students in Berkeley had purchased a couple of copies of the game and made a tutorial and we're using the game as a study aid and, and we say this again and again on our website please do not use this as your primary means of learning medicine and therapeutics. If you do, that's a problem, and you can't round with me. So, um, so we, we were very specific about that, but the fact that people were using the cards as an adjunct, they were playing the game some of the time, and for the most of the time, just keeping the cards in their pocket and using the imagery as a branching off point for, um, for, for studying. And uh, they actually even put together a tutorial on YouTube, which I'm not going to... Uh, no, why don't we go ahead and skip that. But the fact that organically, a group of young students that we weren't even in contact with just kind of developed this on their, of their own accord as a service to other players of the game, that really blew our minds. There was a larger diaspora of players of this game that we weren't aware of, and they were using it as an adjunct to their, their learning, which was really, really exciting for us. Which made us think, you know, there's something powerful about the art. A lot of time and thought and dedication had gone into planting these little Easter eggs of knowledge within the art. And wouldn't it be great if we could open this up to a larger diaspora? Which took us to that uh, paper napkin conversation with uh, George Jacob, who really has just kind of stepped us through the process of taking things, you know, postage stamp sized art and converting it into um, what we hope is a visually compelling exhibit. But the best part of all of this is using the art as a platform to teach um, the general public about concepts of antibiotic stewardship and in fact uh, an appreciation for these things called antibiotics, which, you know, in many ways have kind of fallen back the wayside um, over sort of miraculous cancer drugs. So we, we want to kind of bring people back to um, sort of a sense of awe with regards to what these antibiotics are. In our, and in our view, they truly are the heroes that fight on our behalf when our bodies are overrun with marauders, so to speak. And so what better person to actually share that information with you than a world-renowned um, expert on the subject. And so, um, before, thank you, well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, before we actually launch into Professor Close's talk, which is, we call him the closer. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's horrible. Um, what I wanted to do was um, give you one last treat, and that was 
um, sort of as a token of gratitude for this exhibition and uh, um, a move from just gaming to more of a public health initiative, we specifically worked with a local artist and a member of the Chinese team to develop a new, a, a brand new image of um, a, a new very powerful antibiotic. And so here to kind of walk you through that creation process and also showcase uh, the work of this wonderful young individual that, that we've had the honor to work with um, is uh, my lovely cute nerd, Ziva Matthews, uh, MD as she likes to uh, demand to be called in our household. And, um, and uh, Ziva, you have the floor. <laughs> oh, sure. I'd like to start off by saying that I may be a little bit nerdy, but I'm not as much of a nerd as my husband. <laughs> I don't really play with video games, and the limit of my gaming experience was the first Prince of Persia, was that 15 years ago. Um, anyway, I'm sure you've all realized that this is a very unusual and atypical merging of very different disciplines. You wouldn't expect fantasy art and medicine in the same room let alone talking about the same thing. In that same vein, it has been a challenge to find people, and artists specifically, who are willing to stretch their boundaries and incorporate medicine into their art. So we were very excited when we, about a year and a half ago, found a local artist by the name of Raul Gonzalez. We met him through a third party, a friend, and he was interested enough to put his passion behind working on um, an original image, as well as uh, doing the art layout for our uh, compendium of antibiotics and bacteria called Bacterinomicon. And uh, Raul is here today, and I'd like to invite our very own Raul Gonzalez from the Permian Basin to unveil the image of Lunezalid. Raul, are you here? And now the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Carl Close. Um, Dr. Close is a professor of microbiology at the University of Texas San Antonio. He received his PhD in microbiology at um, University of California, Berkeley in 1993 and performed postdoctoral studies in micro, microbial pathogenesis at Harvard Medical School prior to being hired as an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology in the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio in 1997. He moved to uh, UTSA in 2004 and is the founder of the South Texas Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases, which consists of 18 infectious disease labs Dr. Close's research focuses on understanding bacterial pathogenesis in order to develop effective vaccines and therapeutics. His laboratory studies, his laboratory studies Vibrio cholera and Francisella tularensis, both of which are in the Healing Blade, I'm pleased to report, as well as several other human bacterial pathogens. He is an author on more than 84 peer-reviewed publications and has received funding from numerous sources including the NIH, Department of Defense, and the Thracia Research Fund. He has mentored many PhD masters and undergraduate students, as well as postdoctoral fellows, and international visiting students from India, Spain, Austria, Germany, and Chile. He has twice been the recipient of the ASM Visiting Professorship, with a visit to Kolkata in India uh, in 2004, and a second to Valparaiso, Chile, in 2012. He received the 2002 Presidential Junior Research Scholar Award at UTHSCA and the 2009 President's Distinguished Research Achievement Award at UTSA. And he's joined by his fantastic son and car connoisseur, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Professor 
Professor Close is here to walk us through and uh, give us kind of a revisit of his fantastic TED Talk um, on antibi antimicrobial resistance. So are we good to go? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be here. And I want to tell you about antibiotics and bacteria. Which I, love. This is, I can shout. I can shout. You can hear me. I don't need this. I teach undergraduates, so I can, I can be loud enough that you guys can hear me. Antibiotics were the wonder drugs of the 20th century. Amazingly, antibiotics are responsible for extending the average human life about 10 years. But now we're in the middle of a global crisis where antibiotics are losing their effectiveness against infectious diseases. The headlines are alarming. Bacteria are rapidly becoming resistant to all of the antibiotics that we currently use. Now in order to understand the nature of this problem, you have to understand bacteria. We live in a world filled with bacteria. Bacteria are everywhere. Everything that you touch, everything that you put in your mouth, everything that you sit on, everything that you look at is covered in millions and millions of bacteria. They're so small that you cannot see them without a microscope, but they are there and they are literally everywhere. They're at the bottom of the deepest ocean. They're at the top of the tallest mountain. They're even in the polar ice sheets. They can live in places where there is no sunlight, no food, no oxygen. They can grow in radioactive waste and in boiling hot springs and in toxic chemicals. When bacteria find a place where they can survive, they will multiply very fast to high numbers. Now, one of the places that bacteria like to call home is the human body. There are over 10,000 different types of bacteria that live in the human body. In fact, there are more bacterial cells in you than human cells. And there's more bacterial genes in you than human genes. So in other words, each one of you is actually more bacterial then you are human. <laughs> so turn to your neighbor and say hello to Mr. Staphylococcus on your left <laughs> and Ms. Lactobacillus on your right. So now that we've established that I'm talking to a room full of bacteria, I'm going to flatter you all here a little bit and tell you that bacteria are amazing organisms. And one of the things that makes them so amazing is their ability to share genes with each other. So I need to describe this a little bit more because this lies at the heart of how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. So as you probably know, who you are lies in your genes. So for example, if you're tall or you have blue eyes, it's because you have genes that make you tall or that give you blue eyes. And so likewise, bacteria that can live in Antarctica have genes that make them resistant to the cold. And bacteria that are not killed by penicillin have genes that make them resistant to penicillin. So where did these genes come from? Well, so we're familiar with humans who are born with a set of genes that they inherit from their parents and they keep the same genes until the day that they die. So for example, if you have brown eyes, even if you wish that you have blue eyes, your eyes will remain brown until the day that you die because these are the genes that you were born with. But this is not true for bacteria who are in the habit of sharing genes with all of the bacteria around them in some extremely amazing ways. And so one of the ways that bacteria share genes with each other is they pick them up from their surroundings and this usually happens after one of their neighbors has died. So we're going to call this the funeral grab. Okay? So bacterium number one dies and it releases its genes. And now bacterium number two picks those genes up and takes them in. And now bacterium number two can do something 
that previously only bacterium number one could do. So this is the equivalent of you going to the funeral of someone who had blue eyes, taking a piece of their body out of the casket and eating it, and all of a sudden, you have blue eyes too. But now imagine that instead of blue eyes, you now are resistant to tetracycline. So another way that bacteria can share genes is through viruses. So yes, bacteria get viruses too. They get their version of the flu. And there are a lot of different viruses that infect bacteria. So we're going to call this technique the viral pass. So bacterium number one gets infected with a virus, which picks up its genes and then injects them into bacterium number two. Now bacterium number two can do something that previously only bacterium number one could do. So now this is the equivalent of you catching the flu from someone with blue eyes. And after you catch the flu, your eyes turn blue too. But now imagine that instead of blue eyes, you're now resistant to methicillin. And the third way that bacteria um, can share genes is through sex. So yes, bacteria have a type of sex. And they're pretty promiscuous. So we're going to call this technique making whoopee. <laughs> bacterium number one, the donor, builds a bridge to bacterium number two, the recipient, through which genes are passed from the donor to the recipient. Much like sexual activity that you're familiar with. But at the end of this sexual activity, bacterium number two can now do something that previously only bacterium number one could do before sex. So this is the equivalent of having sex with a blue-eyed partner, and then after sex, your eyes turn blue too. But now imagine that instead of blue eyes, you're now resistant to vancomycin. So you can see there's a lot of gene sharing that goes on among bacteria. And with over 10,000 different types of bacteria that live in the human body, not to mention all the billions of bacteria everywhere you look, this is a huge community that is sharing antibiotic resistance genes. So in order to understand antibiotic resistance, you also need to understand how antibiotics work. So as you probably um, can imagine, bacteria are very different than humans. And what that means is that bacteria have a lot of different components that can be targeted by specific chemicals. Antibiotics are fantastic drugs because they can kill a bacterium without harming a human by recognizing a specific component that's only found in a bacterium and not a human. They work like a key in a lock, very specifically finding and binding their target, which leads to an activation of the bacterium. But now bacteria have evolved a lot of different defensive maneuvers to avoid being killed by antibiotics. So we're going to talk about three ways that bacteria can become resistant. And the first way I'm going to call the upchuck. So the antibiotic targets something specific inside the bacterial cell. But as soon as the antibiotic gets inside, the bacteria barfs it right back out, which prevents it from finding its target. This is a technique that bacteria use to be resistant to tetracycline. The next way I'm going to, I'm going to call the stealth mode. So the antibiotic targets something specific in the bacterial cell. So the bacterium changes the target just enough so that the antibiotic no longer recognizes it. The target is in stealth mode. The antibiotic has no effect and the bacterium is resistant. It's kind of like changing the lock in your house so that someone who stole your key can't get in. This is a technique that bacteria use to be resistant to streptomycin. And the third way I'm going to call the ballistic missile defense. So the bacteria makes a type of weapon that goes and finds the antibiotic and destroys it before the antibiotic can get into the bacterium. The bacterium sends out waves of these missiles that break down the antibiotic and they allow the bacterium to survive. This is a technique that bacteria use to be resistant to penicillin. So you can see that bacteria have evolved a lot of different maneuvers to avoid being killed by antibiotics. And these include upchucks, stealth modes, and ballistic missiles. And the genes for these antibiotic resistance mechanisms are shared among bacteria through funeral grabs, viral passes, and making whoopee. Now, remember the important attributes of bacteria. They're small, they multiply fast, 
and they share genes with each other. Your body is chock full of billions of good, innocent bacteria that cause you no harm. They live in a peaceful, gated community inside of you. But now, let's say that some bad bugs move into this neighborhood and start causing trouble. Being obnoxious, playing loud music, trashing the neighborhood. You feel sick? So you go to the doctor and you get some antibiotics and you take them. The antibiotics kill off most of the bad bugs as well as many of the good innocent bacteria. So now you're feeling better. The neighborhood is quieted down. So you stop taking the antibiotics earlier than the doctor prescribed. So what happens next? Well, let's say that one of these good bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic. So when half of the neighborhood dies off from this antibiotic Armageddon, it multiplies fast to occupy all those empty houses. And now let's say that all of the bad bugs weren't killed by the antibiotic because you stopped taking it early. So one bad bug is still alive. Now one of these good resistant bacteria is feeling a little amorous. So it donates its antibiotic resistance genes to the bad bug. Now this bad bug is resistant. It can multiply fast and even worse, it can go on to infect someone else and trash another neighborhood. But the next person to get infected with this bad bug is in trouble because now the antibiotic no longer works. And this scenario is one example of what has been happening ever since antibiotics were introduced into the market. Ironically, the extended exposure of bacteria to antibiotics is the cause of the emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And remember, bacteria are everywhere and they're sharing genes with each other. So all of the bacteria that are exposed to antibiotics, even the millions of good innocent bacteria that cause you no harm, can share antibiotic resistance genes with the bad bugs who do cause disease. Now this has led to the emergence of a whole new crop of superbugs with scary sounding supervillain names like Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, otherwise known as MRSA, Vancomycin resistant Enterococci, otherwise known as VRE, and Carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, otherwise known as CRE. Now, this is a real rogues gallery right here. So, what led us to this problem? Overprescription of antibiotics by doctors, the failure of patients to take the correct dosage, the easy access to over the counter antibiotics, and the heavy usage of antibiotics in livestock have all led to the creation of these superbugs that are, are resistant to multiple antibiotics. So, what can we do about the problem? Well, first of all, Doctors should not prescribe antibiotics to their patients unless they have a bacterial infection. Viral diseases like the flu or a cold can't be treated with antibiotics because they only work against bacteria and viruses are not bacteria. When you have a bacterial infection, take the complete course of antibiotics prescribed or you may be promoting antibiotic resistance. Don't self-prescribe antibiotics for example, by taking over-the-counter antibiotics, which are freely available in many countries. Patients who experiment with self-medication breed lots of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And try to choose antibiotic-free meat products when you go grocery shopping. About 80% of all of the antibiotics sold in the United States are used to promote growth in livestock, which leads to increased amounts of antibiotic-resistant bacteria in food products. So all of these solutions are important and we should follow them. But realistically speaking, bacteria are not confined by political boundaries. We are able to make these changes at home, but we have little ability to change the habits of others in other countries where many of these superbugs arise. So what else can we do? The best solution 
is to invest in new antibiotic discovery and development. Our current stable of antibiotics is fast becoming obsolete because infectious bacteria over time have developed resistance to them. But new antibiotic development has decreased dramatically in the past several decades, with only two new classes of antibiotics developed in the past 40 years. We are struggling to contain these superbugs because they have developed counter solutions to all of our weapons. As in any war, in order to defeat them, we need to continuously come up with new and more powerful weapons to fight and defeat them. And the time to invest in new antibiotic development is now, before we are completely out of weapons. This needs to be a continuous, sustained effort. One that really should be considered a global health arms race. New antibiotics need to be developed continuously and released continuously into the market. As you can now appreciate, it is inevitable that bacteria will eventually become resistant. But by this time, the next antibiotic will be ready. Now a sobering thought is that many of the people in this room are only here today because antibiotics saved your life at some point in the past. We need to avoid returning to the pre-antibiotic era when common bacterial infections resulting from things like a scratch or the strep throat could sometimes be a death sentence. In this manner, with new antibiotics, we can maintain the upper hand against the rise of the superbugs. Thank you. Oh yeah. So uh, I am pleased to report we are almost done with our uh, session here, but um, I, I feel it's very important to state that um, Dr. Close, when we approached him about this talk, um, he refused uh, uh, any sort of uh, honoraria for actually giving this talk, which I think is a testament to uh, his belief in using um, academia to inform the public. So I just wanted to thank you very much for that. Um, in lieu of the honoraria, we, we like to uh, donate that amount to um, uh, Medicine Sans Frontières that uh, uh, does wonderful work distributing um, cholera oral rehydration kits um, and uh, it's, 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 not an it's not more antibiotics into the world, but it's a surprisingly uh, potent treatment for uh, patients that are suffer suffering from uh, cholera infection. So having said that, I, I just I can't thank you enough. Um, seeing so many faces that we recognize, and in fact faces that we don't recognize, suggests that there is a uh, absolute interest in this concept of conceptual blending, taking one side of science and making it accessible um, to the general public through engaging works of um, art and dialogue and creating narratives around that. It, it just, it, it makes my little nerd heart flutter knowing that uh, there are so many other nerdlings in West Texas. Um, we will be here um, for the rest of the evening uh, we invite you to uh, have some refreshments, um, have a look at the exhibit. We'd love to chat with you if you have any questions about it. But um, the reason tonight is a, is a success is uh, because of all of you. So thank you very much.